I'm Mike Lewis, pastor of Bethlehem United Methodist Church and Heiberger United Methodist Church. And we're coming to you this morning from the sanctuary in Bethlehem United Methodist Church. So I'm glad you could join us this morning. Uh, we are still doing our worship services online so that you can stay home and be safe during these days of uh, spike in coronavirus cases in our area. So let me just commend you and encourage you to continue to wear your mask if you're out, to stay home as much as you can, to keep your distance, uh, wash your hands, all those things you know by now are the things we can do to keep ourselves safer during this time. And I appreciate all that you're doing. Continue to pray for one another. Continue to reach out to one another through phone calls and texts and emails and just make sure that um, we keep up, especially with people that might be having a harder time or need some help. Uh, that's what churches do during hard times and I, I commend you for doing that as well. I know you are. Um, today we are continuing our series, Imagine the Future, and we're looking today at a passage of scripture from Proverbs chapter 16, if you'd like to go ahead and turn there. But we welcome you this morning, and uh, would you just uh, join with, with me now in a word of prayer as we open our service, our worship service today. Father God, thank you for another day of life. Thank you for health. Lord, thank you for this church. We pray, Lord, that uh, you will be with us in our worship today as we're continuing to adjust to worship uh, from our homes, being separated from our church buildings. God, help us. Help us to continue to worship with our whole hearts and to listen as your Spirit speaks to us. Thank you for the tools we have to reach out through uh, video. And God, we pray that you will bless our worship service today. We dedicate it to you. We confess our need for you, Lord, and our need for forgiveness for our sins. We pray that you'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness and renew a right spirit within us. So, Lord, we dedicate our time to you. Bless us as we worship you in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you join me in... Uh, reciting the Apostles Creed I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified dead and buried the third day he arose from the dead he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, uh, at this time in our worship service, I know that you have prayer requests on your heart, people you're concerned about, concerned about issues affecting our nation and our world. So I'd like to ask if you would just bow before the Lord in a few moments of silent prayer and express your prayers to the Lord, and then I will lead us in our congregational prayer. Lord, we come before you as a congregation, combining our prayers. Lord, we do pray for those that we love, that are, that are our friends, our acquaintances, people in our community that are uh, testing positive for coronavirus or have come down with symptoms or are fighting the illness right now, and for those families of loved ones who've died. 
And we pray for the others, Lord, that are facing other health challenges during this time and medical treatments, that you would be with them, Lord, comfort them, strengthen them, lead them, Lord, draw near to them. And Lord, we do pray today for this coronavirus to come to an end, for there to be effective treatments and vaccines. God, that we pray for the whole world that this would be resolved. And God, we also pray for peace and for justice in our streets and our nation, that we could come together, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all, that we could live up to our ideals and our aspirations. And God, not only for us, but for nations around the world. May we be humble servants, Lord, right here in our own families and our own communities. We pray that you would use us to accomplish your good work. So today, Lord, use this time, we pray, to instill in us the courage and the strength and the wisdom and the skills and the fruits of the Spirit that we need in order to be the people you've called us to be and to do the things you've called us to do. Thank you, Lord. Bless every person that's tuned in today. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we're going to sing a hymn. It's number five in the Red Methodist hymnal. It's called, Come We to Love the Lord. scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Proverbs chapter 16 and I'll be preaching from verses 1 through 4. To humans belong the plans of the heart but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. All a person's ways seem pure to them but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans. The Lord works out everything to its proper end, even the wicked for a day of disaster. This is the word of the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son,
take up an offering normally at this time in our worship services. So I'd like to um, encourage you to continue to mail your tithes and offerings into the church. And I'd like us to join in prayer for God to bless our tithes and offerings this morning. Lord, thank you for um, the opportunity to worship through our giving. You have blessed us abundantly and exceedingly about what we could ask or think. And so, God, we pray that we can be good stewards of all that we have and that our tithes and offerings would be an expression of our gratitude and our commitment to serve you with our whole hearts. Thank you, Lord. Bless your churches. Build your churches up and make us strong. We pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. So, once again this morning, we're in the book of Proverbs, as I was last Sunday in my sermon. Uh, we read Proverbs 16, verses 1 through 4, which I'll use for my text for preaching this morning. But I want you to hear uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, which is the introduction to the book of Proverbs. Uh, you might say that it's the purpose statement for the book of Proverbs. Uh, you may be aware that Proverbs is in two main sections. Uh, chapters 1 through 9 are the introduction to the book of Proverbs. And those chapters basically tell us why we need to read the rest of the book of Proverbs. Because wisdom is valuable. We need to get wisdom. Wisdom is important for us as Christians who are living out our lives in this world. And then chapters 10 through 31, the rest of the book of Proverbs, is filled with wise sayings. Most of them are two lines, some are three lines, and occasionally four. But they are memorable, and they are easy for us to hide away in our minds and in our hearts, and they're important for life. So let me begin by reading uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise man listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Proverbs chapter one, verse seven. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I spoke about that some last Sunday in my sermon. Um, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 is the exact same thing. And that comes at the end of these nine chapters of introduction. And again, he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So that's something important that he wants us to understand as we read and study Proverbs. The worship of the Lord is related to wisdom. And Solomon, in writing this, was concerned about both. He knew they were interrelated. So, worship of the Lord is another way of saying fear the Lord. To worship God means to revere Him, to be in awe of Him, to know that He is God, that His ways are above our ways, that He is awesome. So, we worship the Lord, and that is 
related to wisdom. We can't have true wisdom without a relationship, a proper relationship with the Lord. As a matter of fact, David Platt said, wisdom is the fruit of a right relationship with God. Wisdom is the fruit of a right relationship with God. So wisdom springs forth from a right relationship with God. Wisdom results out of a right relationship with God. So Proverbs is an important book. It's not just this old book of pithy sayings plopped down into the middle of the Bible, but it's an important part of God's redemption story in the whole Bible. I'd like to share with you a couple of more scriptures. Uh, this one comes from 1 Kings chapter 3. And this is Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 3 beginning in verse 5. It says, At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, Ask for whatever you want, ask for whatever you want me to give to you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father, David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people, and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for a long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. So Solomon asks for an understanding mind and for wisdom, and God responds, I will give you a wise mind. And then listen to 1 Kings chapter 4, beginning in verse 29. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breath of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East and greater than all of the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan, the Ezraite, wiser than Hermon, Calpol of the Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about plant life, from the cedars of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of Solomon's wisdom. So this is pretty incredible. Solomon prayed and asked God to give him wisdom, and God answered his prayer, made him more wise than anyone. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and some of those are going to be uh, the, the verses I talk about today. And you need to know that in the context of Israel's history and redemption history in the Bible, this is where Solomon has just become king, He's asked for wisdom, he's been given wisdom, and now he builds the temple. In chapter 5, he prepares to build the temple. In chapter 6, he builds the temple, and in chapter 8, he dedicates the temple. So, you could say that at this point in history, at this point in Israel's history and in salvation history of the whole Bible, uh, for the people of Israel, for the Old Testament, this relationship between wisdom and worship reached its pinnacle. 
We are at the apex of wisdom and worship in Israel's history. Had the wisest king, the temple was completed, so wisdom and worship came together like never before and like never since for the old covenant for the people of Israel. So the wisdom of Solomon is tied to the worship established by Solomon. And in the same way our relationship with God affects our relationships with one another. Our relationship with God affects how we live our lives and how we can experience a life of flourishing in this world as God intends. So Proverbs is about wisdom and worship. I'll also say that 18 times in the book of Proverbs, it says, fear the Lord, revere the Lord, respect the Lord, be in awe of the Lord, revere him as the almighty creator of all things. In Proverbs 3, God is creator. So wisdom starts with recognition that God is our creator. He created each of us, all of us, with his own hands. And God is sustainer. God rules and reigns over everything. All times are in God's hands. So God created us, created you, fashioned you with his own hands, and he holds your days in his hands. You may make plans, but God guides. So that brings us back to Proverbs 16, 1 through 4. This is right in the middle of Proverbs. Proverbs has 31 chapters. Uh, you read a chapter a day in one month, you could read the entire book of, of Proverbs. Only about 15% of all the verses in Proverbs actually mention the Lord, only 15%. But the greatest concentration of those verses that do mention the Lord occur right here in Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 16, 1 through 4, three times in three verses. In verse 1 it says, from the Lord comes the answer of the tongue. Verse 2, motives are weighed by the Lord. And in verse 3, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Solomon is reminding us here that our plans are not always God's plans. You know, in the South we have a saying. <laughs> we say, Lord willing, right? Uh, sometimes people say, Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. Well, that's a recognition that we need to make plans with humility because God may have something different in store. Plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer comes from the Lord. A few years back, quite a few years back, about a decade ago, I was interviewed. I was called to come to Atlanta, Georgia to be interviewed for the position of National Director for Church Starts for my whole denomination. So I went to Atlanta, they put me up in a room, the next day I had my interview, and I nailed it. <laughs> um, I felt great about the interview, everybody there told me I did great. One of the interviewers, after the interviewer told me to go ahead and make plans to move to Atlanta. So I went house hunting before I came back to Alabama. I drove around Atlanta with a realtor's guide, and. And I was looking for my place to live so sure that I was going to be hired for that job. After all, my whole career basically had been in preparation for this. But then the executive director of the whole denomination decided that they would defund church starts and eliminate this position altogether. So the job wasn't there. So I was disappointed, and I was confused, and I was disheartened. My plans were dashed. You know, I like to think that my identity is not tied up in my achievements, but truthfully, in my heart, those were my plans. And I had aspired to achieve those plans, and I, I guess I even had a sense that God owed this to me because I had been faithful in my whole career leading up to this. I had all the education, all the training, all the experience. I was the most qualified, and it was taken away from me. 
So I had to come to grips with the truth that my plans are not always God's plans. My life is in God's hands. That hurt. And it was hard. I had asked all my friends to pray for me. They were all telling me that I was a shoe-in for the job. Now I had to go back and tell them that I didn't get it. Not only that, but they weren't even going to prioritize church planting. So I was embarrassed, and I was sad, and I felt humiliated. Now I want you to know that Proverbs 16.1 is not against planning. The Bible encourages us to make wise plans. Think of Joseph. He planned for the seven years of famine. And Esther planned for months before she approached the king. And Nehemiah had a plan for rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. So the Bible is full of planning and planners. The point is not that we shouldn't make wise plans, but that ultimately, they rely upon the actions of God. So Proverbs 16.1 is about our plans. Verse 2 is about self-deception. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. 1 John 1.8 says, If we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So it's possible for us to deceive ourselves. You know, it's troubling to me when leaders in our culture can't name a time when they made a mistake or they can't name a time when they've ever sought forgiveness. It takes wisdom to understand that I need to approach my plans with humility and be willing to confess and admit my own failures and shortcomings. Foolishness is when we try to justify our shortcomings by blaming others, saying it was somebody else's fault. Facing our faults or disappointments has a way of revealing our true character, and that's important. God uses these occasions to reveal to us some of the idols that we have in our lives. Now, I'm not talking about the kind of idol that we build a golden calf and bow down to it. That's obvious. But I'm talking about those idols that we may not even recognize sometimes in ourselves that are just as severe, just as problematic. The idol of academic achievement or the idol that I alone can solve all my problems or the idol of self-justification, the idol of reputation. These are important epiphanies in our spiritual development and becoming fully mature followers of Jesus Christ. It's painful when you come face to face with your idols because you realize that your faith maybe has not penetrated all the way down into your heart as you had assumed. Proverbs 16 is a reminder that God knows our hearts. God knows our true motivations. And then in verse 3, we have the solution to our situation. You know what the solution is? Surrender. Verse 3 literally means to roll over or to surrender. So what this means that is that we need to commit our daily walk and our daily work to the Lord and in turn trusting Him to establish my plans. That's part of the purpose of prayer, isn't it? It's daily self-surrender. Prayer signals our acceptance of incompleteness and our desire to receive from God what we cannot supply for ourselves. I ask God for His help and assistance even in ordinary affairs of everyday life. God cares about those things. God wants to be with us and for us for those things. God has a plan. So prayer is an exercise in humility and getting ourselves out of the way and to put ourselves in full service to God and to others, to sacrifice ourselves in service to God and others. So tough times have a way of schooling us 
in the importance of prayer and humility. Sometimes prayers even become heart cries. They become groans. The Bible says that can become groanings too deep for, the, for words and the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. So in that experience, I learned some things about myself that I needed to learn. How much pride had become a part of my identity. How I often told God what I wanted, but rarely asked what he wanted with my life. Now, God does not say give your plans over to God. It says give over to God your daily work. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. If you're trying to get a, a master plan for your life, a 20-year plan for your life, then Proverbs 16 says it doesn't work that way. Day by day, in a process of surrender, you say, Lord, today I give you this day. And in so doing, I trust that you have a bigger plan for my life that I currently can't even imagine or realize. That's what Proverbs 16 teaches us. I can honestly say with my whole heart that I'm glad that Atlanta job did not work out. With 2020 hindsight, I can see that that job would have been filled with frustrations and challenges. I've grown in ways that I wouldn't have grown I have been given opportunities I would not have been given. And I can say with confidence, God knew best. God always knows best, right? 2020 so far has been a year of dashed plans for a lot of people. And it's not over yet. People had plans for 2020 for school, for graduations, for sports for marriages, for reunions, for all kinds of things. And it didn't work out that way. But Proverbs 16.4 says, The Lord works out everything to its proper end. The Lord works out everything to its proper end. It says it another way in Romans 8.28. All things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are the called according to his purpose. Would you pray with me this morning? God, uh, thank you for giving wisdom to Solomon and that we have that wisdom recorded in the book of Proverbs for all time. Thank you for the teaching for us that is so practical, so timely for today, that we need to trust you. It's good to make good, wise plans, but also to approach them with humility, to know that you know our motives even better than we do. And so it's important to go to you in prayer humbly committing our works and our ways to you every day, every step, and then trusting that you will work it all out. You will work everything out to its proper end, and we trust you, Lord. Thank you. So today, comfort your people, God. Remind them of your strong leadership, your daily involvement in our everyday lives. You know what's going on, and you're there with us. We trust in you. Thank you, God. Thank you. We pray these things in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now we're going to sing a hymn. It's number 306 in the Methodist hymnal.
to work together for our good. Let's walk in his ways and trust him with our whole hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace.